Now, just in review, we've busted a lot of the myths that people have about God. Because it's not enough to just run through this life perusing a few little things, catching a few phrases, and then championing those phrases. So we've, we've erased those. We need to erase some of those wrong thoughts that we've had of God. Or the wrong thoughts about religion or spiritual life. Stuff like, you know, everything happens for a reason. I have faith. I believe everything happens for a reason. Well, that's a dumb belief. That's not in the Bible. Where'd you get that from? But people say it because others have said it. So we've erased that when we've taught through the whole God is sovereign, the black hole theory, which, which means that everything that happens is His will. We don't know anything about His will. We don't really want to know anything about His will, so we'll just throw it in that bucket so we don't have to think about it anymore. So we've busted that myth. We've busted the God is testing us theory. We've busted the God is punishing us theory. Uh, and then we've found some of the right reasons why bad things actually happen. Why is suffering still here? Why do people have such terrible tragedies and such happen to them? Well, we found three reasons so far. There's two more I wanted to talk about. But the first one is that really the only reason that anything bad goes wrong at all is because of the glitch. It's because of original sin. Everybody with me? So let's just re we're just reviewing that we have to admit that nothing would be going wrong at all if it wasn't for humans deciding to sin. It's not God's will that bad things happen. Never was. The second reason for bad things happening is lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. For what they don't know, people get destroyed. Amen. Think of all the spiritual, reason, spiritual promises, spiritual principles that we've learned to help us in life, help us step over obstacles, avoid things, not play close to the death. Think of all the things that we've learned. People that don't know those are at risk or at higher risk. So lack of knowledge, and it plays no favorites. It happens with believers and non-believers. What you don't know can kill you. Then the third reason for all bad things is the devil. Now most people think that's the only reason, but no, he, he's one of the reasons why bad things happen. Some are directly related to Satan himself, to demons themselves, to the devil himself. He has a plan to kill and destroy and steal from every human. Whether Christian or non-Christian, he wants to hurt people. He don't like people. He's... He's jealous of people, uh, he's just jealous, he's jealous of all the humans that God made in his image, okay? So now we're to the fourth reason, but before we get to the fourth reason, I wanted, I wanted to uh, just help us kick over a couple extra rocks before we go into reasons four and five. Are you ready? And what I mean by kick over rocks, these are the thoughts that stop people in their tracks, People learn a few things about the Lord, that prayer works or something, or just ask God in the name of Jesus, okay, and so they go and ask the Lord something, but in the back of their mind they're thinking, but, but I don't know if He will actually answer this prayer because, and then they have the something. And so we have to identify all those little obstacles that might stop our prayer from getting answered. Because if we can't go in full assurance of faith, if we can't have 100% confidence that our prayer can be answered, then it's very difficult for God to answer and so he said, if you have faith with no doubting, he said, if you don't waver, let him ask in faith, not wavering, not being unsure if God will answer. For he that wave, wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Don't let that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. So we have to admit that he said, you can't even think that you're going to get anything from God if you're not sure. If you waver. So we have to kick over all the things that might cause us to waver. Well, here's one of them. You know, people have said, let's just take praying for somebody uh, to not die. And people say, well, no, you can't stop that. I mean, God's appointed a day for everybody to die. I mean, God's God. He appointed the day. So you can't stop the day that He's planned for you to die. Sounds noble, doesn't it? Sounds like, yep, yep, that makes sense. He's God. I mean, he's, he, set, he sets the calendar. Uh, the, the Bible never says that. The Bible never says God's appointed everybody on a certain day to die. Does it? It doesn't. But people have said it so much they almost think that it does. Here's what the scripture actually says. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. 
So Christ was offered once to bear this. So it goes on in context. So, but if you just take that one scripture, it's appointed for men to die one time. That's what the scripture said. But if you just casually read it, it's like, yep, yep, see, God's appointed, something appointed about dying. Yep, He's appointed us a day to die. No, He's appointed us to die one time. Meaning you don't get to die twice. You don't get to try earth life twice. There's no reincarnation. You don't get to come back as a dog or a cat or another gender or any other thing. You only get to die one time, live one earth life. There's no reincarnation. There's no second, second try. There's no in, you don't get to be an insect or a cow or whatever people have said. Uh, you have to die one time and that's it. Then, after this, the judgment. So once you're not on the earth anymore, the next thing you can expect is the judgment. If we're with Christ, it's a glorious thing. If we're not with Christ, it's a horrible expectation. You got it? So we just kick that one over. Okay, so it doesn't say that. Well, doesn't God know everything? Yes, He does. But Him knowing things and Him planning things are two different things. God knows destiny's calendar. But He hasn't etched it all in stone. This is where you have to understand. Predestination... Uh, doesn't mean God is forcing His will on everybody. It's, it's possible for God to know the future without causing the future. Hey, the easy example is Hezekiah. Over in Hezekiah chapter 2. I'm just kidding, there's no Hezekiah. It's 2 Kings chapter 2. God sent the prophet to Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. He sent the prophet to him, said, Tell him to get his house in order, for he shall surely die. For no real reason. I mean, it was just his, he was at the end of his days. Go tell him, he's, get his house in order, he's about to die. So the prophet shows up, tells Hezekiah the bad news. Hezekiah turns to the wall. Remember, he turns his face to the wall and cries out and basically says, No, Lord, come on, let me live. I'm paraphrasing. He didn't say it exactly like that. But he poured his heart out to God and before he even got done praying, God told the prophet, go back, because the prophet had left, go back and tell him, I, I heard his prayer, I'll give him 15 more years. God knew he was about to die, tried to help him get prepared. But then because of his heart's desire, somehow he connected to God. And God said, okay, fine. So it's not etched in stone. You with me? The, the goal is, let's find some promises that help us stay in the earth long enough to fulfill our plan of God. To fulfill His purpose for my life, I have to use my faith. It's not all automatic. You see, some people think it's all automatic. That if God wants me to live long, I'll live long. If He doesn't, I'll live short. No, you need to find out the plan of God and then learn how to walk by faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. That means you've got to learn how to live by faith so you can avoid the, the tragedies and troubles and live as long as you can to fulfill your purpose. Once you've fulfilled your purpose, then you can decide, okay, looks like I'm about satisfied and I'm done here, so I, I can go home anytime, Lord. Jonah just taught on that Wednesday night. I heard it was really good. So that we have a plan for the end. The whole goal is to fulfill the plan of God. To know when our time is up. Know when we've done what we need to do. And then let's hurry up and get to Jesus. I guarantee you that in the last of my days, I'm going to be really assessing, I mean annually. Okay, Lord, am I done? Can, can I be done now? Can I be done? I want to be done. What, what, else, what other assignments do you have for me while I'm on the earth? Because if I'm done, I'm ready. It's not going to be this lingering thing. I want to know stuff. I, I got to know what I'm called to do and use my faith to do it. And then once my assignments are over, there's no lingering. Sorry. Oh, no, pastor, we want you to stay. We want you. Then, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. You'll have to watch the videos that we've posted on YouTube. <laughs> the bottom line is that, that, that God hasn't said, you know, he's all strict and rigid about when you're supposed to go. It's not like that. He said, with long life, I'll satisfy him and show him my salvation. So there's an element of us being satisfied. And then being honest about that. That's 
Uh, let's turn to Daniel chapter 3. We'll, we'll study this little rock. We'll kick this rock over and then we'll get to the fourth reason. Daniel chapter 3. It's over in the Old Testament. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We, we need to know how faith really works, how faith really looks. We did that uh, last Sunday, I think, a little bit. But what does faith look like? Because some people are under the assumption that faith is just my general acceptance of the Bible or my general faith that there's a God or my belief in Jesus Christ. That's my faith. Well, in a general sense, yes. But when it comes to living life, when it comes to the just shall live by faith, that's not just... I live by my religious activity on Sunday. No, not, not faith in the general sense, but faith in the specific sense. Like, I heard from God on this matter, therefore I trust God on that matter. That's faith. I read a scripture about how I can have joy. I believe that scripture. I receive that from God and I'm going to have joy today by faith. I'm going to decide that the scripture is true for me on joy or peace or my identity in Christ, whatever that might be, therefore I have faith in that and I'm going to live my life according to that scripture Amen. on that topic. Amen. And then I'm going to learn the other piece of the pie and the next piece of the pie and I'm going to fulfill, I'm going to, I'm going to complete God's promises by believing every one of them. That's faith. Faith in each section of the pie, of spiritual truth, of promises of God, that's what we're talking about when we say live by faith. We have to hear it, hear the truth, believe the truth, step into that truth, begin to think that way, act that way. That's faith. Okay. <clears throat> Apparently, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew some things about God. That's what we're doing here. We're trying to know the right things about God so we trust Him properly. So that we can stand confidently when necessary. Yes. Daniel chapter 3, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is when Nebuchadnezzar made a decree. He made a golden statue and his decree to all the land was everybody, as soon as the trumpets blow, everybody has to bow to the statue. So they did that and then some Chaldeans came and said, wait, wait, you made this decree, but there's some Jewish boys who's not doing it. And it turned out to be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who Daniel had put in, I mean, who Nebuchadnezzar had put in charge of some of the things of his estate. And so let's pick it up here. Verse 12. The Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. Verse 12 now. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They have not served your gods, nor worshipped the gold image which you have set up. And then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, nor worship the gold image that I've set up? Now he's going to command them, okay? He says, Now, if you're ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image that I've made, good. So he's giving them a second chance. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? You've had thoughts like that in some, you know, fashion. You know, how's God going to deliver you from this one? Where's your God now? You've had those thoughts from the devil. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. <laughs> that was kind of a roll your eyes statement. We don't really have to say anything, but okay, fine, we'll say something. Verse 17, if that is the case, if what is the case? If you're planning on throwing us in the fire because we won't bow, if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. But they didn't stop there. We know God's able. They added the next statement, and He will deliver us from your hand, O King. Notice how positive and definite that is. 
Our God's able and he will. <clears throat> obviously, they, obviously, they must have known a little something. They must have had a little understanding about the nature of their God. That he is the fortress and the deliverer, and under his wings shall you trust. And there shall no arrow fly by day and get you, and no pestilence that walks. They must have known something. Verse 18. He will deliver, or verse, not, verse 17. He will deliver us from your hand, O king. Verse 18. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you've set up. Now, wait a second. That doesn't sound as positive, does it? It's like they say, he's going to deliver us, but if he doesn't, we're still not bowing. That's not what it says. But at first read, and, and I, I'll be honest with you, I used to read this, and I didn't like it. I'm like, wait, we're, we're talking, we always talk about how faith is positive and 100% confident in what it knows. But here it looks like they got this little wavering going on. He's going to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, I'm going to praise him. And Christians have adopted that and carried that on and on and on. And then I had a friend of mine, a preacher friend, preach this one time. And I thought, golly, that makes me so mad at myself for not seeing it. Let's read this in the proper perspective. Notice the statement. Nebuchadnezzar says, if you don't bow, we're going to throw you in the fire. Verse 17, if that's the case, our God is able and he will deliver us. Verse 18, but if not, meaning, but if you don't throw us in the fire, let it be known we're not bowing. So if you do throw us in the fire, he'll deliver us. But if you don't throw us in the fire, let it be known we're not bowing. This was not, we're not sure if God's going to set us free or not. This is simply, he's just talking about what Nebuchadnezzar said. If that's the case, if you do throw us in the fire, God will set, he will deliver us. But if you don't throw us in the fire, we're not bowing. So praise the Lord. I was so glad to see that. I'm like, golly. Because we've always talked about if you want miracles, there is no plan B. You have to get out of the boat. And when you get out of the boat, there's no rope attached. Peter didn't say, well, I'll get out of the boat as long as we're close enough to the shore. Just in case. But it helps, doesn't it? It helps to kick over some of these rocks that bother us. It bothered me. For about three years it bothered me. Maybe longer. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of things that bother Christians when they pray. A lot of little uncertainties from either scriptures they read that didn't understand or something passed around that's not even a scripture. And if we don't get rid of them, it'll, it'll hurt our faith. Amen. It'll cause a little bit too much doubt. And so we won't be confident enough and, and it's, it, we won't even really reach God. So you know the rest of the story. Uh, they get the fire hotter than ever before and they threw them in and the guys that threw them in burned up. And then, and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in the fire and then Nebuchadnezzar walks by and peeks in and uh, he says, Look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, verse 25, and they're not hurt. And the fourth form is like the Son of God. Hmm. And then he got them out of there and, and they didn't even smell like smoke, much less be burned. <clears throat> and then Nebuchadnezzar makes a new decree. Their God is the one true God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, well, it's so good. Let me read it. Verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss, amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses be made an ash heap, because there is no other god who can deliver like this. I say, I just focus. There's no God that can deliver like this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that ahead of time. They weren't wishy-washy. They weren't hoping, wishing, praying, fretting. 
And neither can we be if we want God to deliver like this for us. There's confidence in faith people. When the just really live by faith, there's great confidence. There's an attitude about things. Even when it comes up against the mighty king or the mighty devil or whatever you think is so big in your life. All right. Turn with me to uh, Psalm chapter 103. Psalm chapter 103. Think about... Wait, should we go there? Yeah, yeah, Psalm, Psalm 103 is probably a good place. Okay. Um, back to the football game. Think about the, the, the wide receiver or any player of the football. I know some of you are like, Pastor, please don't use that example. I hate football. <laughs> and this is American football, not South American football. Okay. The practice is important for all the players to learn where to be at any one time. Think of the wide receiver. He has all these patterns to run. He has to know what to avoid. And same thing with us. We have to, we have to be ready for the enemy. If the enemy shows up here, then we dodge. If he, if he shows up here, if he goes low, if he goes high, then we, we have all these different moves. And that, that, that applies to where Paul said, you know, we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. He has strategies. The enemy has a playbook. And so the enemy's plan has to be thwarted by our plan. So there's a lot of this maneuvering that we have to do by faith. We have to understand God enough to avoid all those wrong thoughts, all the wrong people, and get straight to the Holy Spirit. Always taking the, the, the command from the Holy Spirit. Uh, <clears throat> so the fourth reason, the fourth reason for all bad things, and this is a very obvious one, the fourth reason for all bad things is the choice system. That's an obvious one. Bad choices lead to bad consequences. Okay? It's not a mystery. Everybody knows that, even if you're not saved, even if you're not in church. Choices have consequences. You know, if you think about it, your life today is a result of all your choices from yesterday. Where you stand right now is a result of all your choices. Isn't that right? Some good, some bad, some indifferent, but you're here because of choices. So everything in our life really is, it boils down to a choice. <clears throat> I would say a decision. So you could say just learning scripture presents a choice to you. Are you going to make the decision to stand on that truth? Obey that truth. Live your life by that truth and the next truth. And then all those required decisions. Follow me? Somebody said this, that your life today is a result of the seed you planted yesterday. All of your words are choices. All of your words are seeds. They get planted somewhere. They get planted in your heart. They can be good seed or bad seed. They get planted in the kingdom of God. They get planted somewhere and then they grow to produce harvest of good stuff or bad stuff. Thorns and thistles are good fruits, whatever. So from achieving in school as a kid to self-discipline as a kid to all the choices we make in life, my, m minor choices, major choices, um, it all determines our life. So the choice system. Now, in the Bible, there's something very similar to the choice system called the law of sin and death. God laid out all the law and He said, Now I set before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. And then He says, Choose life. So he tells us, the, the, he gives us the whole test and all the answers and says, now choose the right answers. Yeah. And so when we don't, okay, now we're up against something else. We don't choose right, there's something there. So let's talk about it for just a moment so we have it in proper perspective. Uh, I dare say because the cross changed some, some things about the law of sin and death. The cross changed some things about the choice system. And you need to know what that is specifically. Uh, sometimes people think, yeah, well, you're going to get repaid for all your sins. Of course, we remember Galatians chapter 6 that says, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. And so we, 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 if we live with only that scripture, then we're thinking everything I've done bad is going to come back to haunt me. And that can start nipping at your heels in prayer. 
with the thought of, well, I probably deserve this because I hadn't been living perfectly. Well, I probably deserve this because of that thing I did. And some things absolutely have repercussion that's visible and instant or soon, and people have to live with it. And there's nothing, no way around it. There's other things that don't seem to, you know, harvest soon, but one day they might. Then I say there's other things that you've done or planted. There's other seeds that don't have to come up. Okay? Keep that in mind. If you understand the Lord, if you know the blood of Jesus, if you understand the power of the cross, there are some things that don't have to come back to bite you. Okay? So let's read this Psalm 103. Psalm 103 verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Oh wait, did you just pass over that real quickly? He forgives all your iniquities. That's all your immorality, all your propensity to sin, basically all your sin. He forgives all your iniquities. How many of your iniquities? All, all even the bad ones. Even the not so bad ones. Okay, they're all bad. All right. He forgives all your iniquities. He forgives everything you used to do, everything you did when you were a kid, everything, every dumb thing you've ever done, He forgives it. So does he forgive it? Yes. Are you forgiven? Yes. Do you need to live with it? No. Why would you keep living with it then? When you go to prayer, why does it have to come up? Amen. Well, you need faith in the scripture. He forgives all my iniquities. And so I've told God that many times. Oh, thanks God, you forgive all my iniquities. Even that one. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Now I can move along. He forgives all your iniquities who heals all your diseases. Well, except the modern day diseases, you know, because those are a little bit... Blah, 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 blah. All your diseases. He heals all your diseases. You got to know that 100%. And you can be healed right there in the blue chair right there. Before anybody prays, if you just believe that, you'd be healed right there. Just on that one scripture could do the whole thing for you. <clears throat> I guess I'll tell the story. Y'all remember the story? There's a, in Houston, there's, there's a, a, a famous story that happened to a certain preacher. He was a pastor of a Baptist church, radio host, name was Dwayne Miller. You can go find him, on, you can find this whole thing on the web. So here was his story. He, he developed these polyps or something in his throat and uh, lost his voice. So here he is, a pastor. Here he is, a Sunday school teacher. Here he is, you know, uh, his livelihood depends on him being able to teach the Bible. And he lost his voice. And the doctor said, there's no way, we can't do surgery because it'll ruin everything. So you'll never recover. These will keep growing and they'll ruin you forever. You'll never be able to talk again. And so here he is devastated. But he was determined that he was going to, you know, do his best. And so there's a recording of him in a Sunday school class. Uh, and he was teaching the Bible. And you can hear this on the recording that he can't, you can't hear it, he, does not, he doesn't really have a voice, he's whispering it. And he's talking like this, and he's, he's reading Psalm 103, and he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness. And he stops, and he stops, and he, you can hear him on the recording, he said, uh, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I, I don't know what just happened here. And I'm thinking, I do. I, I, I know what happened. I know what happened. Your heart must have leaped up and grabbed that scripture. Faith in action right there. Somehow the word came alive in your heart when you read it. Or when you spoke it out of your mouth, it came alive somehow in the spirit realm. And God did a miracle for you. And he was totally healed forever. Totally healed. Still, he preached the gospel for decades. He might still be pastoring out there in Bel Air, I think is where he was. But anyway, there's power in the Word of God. You got to know that. You got to believe it. You got you to put all you got in it. Who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. 
The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. There is a wrath of God coming. Not, not for us, but there is a wrath of God coming. Verse 10, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Did you underline that in your Bible? I got underlining and comments and everything right there about that on my. He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Aren't you glad? And like we've said before, that's why there's not just a pile of ashes sitting in these blue chairs. Because if you got what was coming to you, you wouldn't be here. We deserve a lot more punishment than we've, well, we haven't received any. It says right there, he's not dealt with us that way. Now, I believe that David really kind of saw through the cross to establish this promise. Uh, David was a special one. He saw some things that only the new covenant provided in full. Hey, but when you have faith in something, God will answer you. It's the nature of God. So it wasn't like he violated something when he thought this and said this. Okay. Now we're going to go back to the law and see what David knew even. We're going to go back to the law as if we were a Jew and we're going to take a look at something. Okay, go back to um, Deuteronomy chapter 28. But I dare to say, hey, get that promise in you. Get that promise. So when you go to prayer, you don't have to think, yep, God's probably, probably, probably doing this to me, probably doing that to me, probably I deserve this. And if, you, if you'll get that in your heart, then you can combat all your karma, friends. <laughs> Karma's not a good thing. No, That's what they say. Uh, fate, uh, destiny, uh, repercussion, uh, reciprocal, whatever. But wait, wait, no. Between me and God, He's not punished me according to my iniquities. Thank God for that. Why? Why isn't he? Why isn't God punishing us for our iniquities? Oh, because there's this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this person named Jesus Christ, uh, who's the Son of God. He came to the earth. He was punished for us. He shed holy blood so I don't have to be punished. Um, Jesus, the Savior, is elevated to the place of, took my place. He took my place. God allowed all the iniquity on Jesus so He doesn't have to punish me for mine. So Jesus is the ultimate for everybody. you got to know that, though. You can't think about God without Jesus. You can't approach God without Jesus. Isn't that right? Only through Jesus can we understand God's attitude toward me. If you try to go to God with Old Testament attitude, oh, it's scary. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all His commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So I'm not going to read the, the blessings. Uh, I'm going to skip them, because everybody thinks they should be supremely blessed. And let's go to the curses. Verse 15. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all His commandments and His statutes which I command you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be basically your bank accounts. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, rebuke, and all that you set your hand to do until you're destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doing which you've forsaken me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you and He's consumed you from the land which you're going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, inflammation. Ugh. Do you all want me to keep reading? 
Notice, the, these ter- Notice all these words. All these words are part of the curse. Okay? You need to know that so that if you ever have one of these touch you, you know something about it. And what we're going to get to is that you don't have to think, yep, see, because I did that thing I did. Scorching and, and mildew. Even mildew is part of the curse. Curse that mildew back. (laughs) Curse it back. Verse 27, the Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt, with tumors, with the scab, with the... Oh, sorry. Blindness and madness and confusion of heart. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. Okay, but you need to know that this is here. This is the curse list. Now, why does the curse come? If you don't obey all the commands. Why does the curse come? If you don't obey all the commands. Everybody was susceptible to the curse. The law said if you sin... You die. And that's really the whole purpose of this. Go to verse 45. All these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep His commandments and His statutes. The purpose of the curse was to destroy. It was to bring death to the sinner. It's called the law of sin and death. Go to Romans chapter 8. Let's go ahead and take a few thousand year journey through the cross after the plan of God has been fulfilled. Romans chapter 8. So remember why the curse comes. Just a, just a quickie. Why did the curse come? Because of disobedience. Why do all these curses fall on people? Because they disobey. Now if you stop there and don't read through or don't understand the New Testament, or don't read the Old Testament with New Testament goggles on, then you will be plagued in prayer. Thinking, oh, how could you possibly bless an old worm like me, God? If possible, please do this, but I doubt you can. That's been the attitude in prayer for decades in some churches, in some Christians. Isn't that right? Therefore, nobody has any real trust that God will say yes to their prayer request. But if you learn some things about this new covenant, Romans chapter 8 verse 1, There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That means there's no judgment if you're in Christ from God, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life, there's a new law. It's the Spirit of life law. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That goes against our, you know, as human beings in this earth. You know, we have to live the earth way to some degree. And in the earth, we believe in the merit system. Which is, if you do good, you get an A. If you play well, you win the game. If you're the best employee, you get the best raise. And if you're the worst employee, you might get fired. So there's a merit system in the earth that we abide by. We should abide by it. Everybody shouldn't get the first place trophy. (laughs) Because then they don't know how to really work in this earth. But on the spiritual side, you have to understand things have changed. God has removed the merit system. Now being good does not automatically get get the blessing. Being good does not automatically get the blessing. You still have to learn the promise, believe the promise, receive the promise by faith to get the blessing. A lot of good people go to hell. You mean he sends good people to hell? No, he sends people without Christ to hell. But on the other side of the coin, 
if, if being good doesn't get the blessing, being bad doesn't get the curse now. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from that law of sin and death. What was the law of sin and death? If you do bad, you get cursed. So now, if I disobey, I don't get cursed. Or, or, can you say that in church? You better say that in church. This is what frees the Christian from condemnation. So that we remove the threat of God's penalty coming toward you. I mean, we didn't. The cross did. Jesus Christ removed the threat of God's wrath. And you got to know this deep down. It's got to be, it's got to make you happy every day about this. Thank God that my disobedience didn't cause him to curse me or punish me. I, every time I say that in church, I know people are thinking, is he getting too close to the line? Is he getting close? <laughs> this is a big deal. This is so that you and I start feeling right about ourselves in Christ, valuing the blood of Jesus where it should be. I'm freed from the law of sin and death. Now, I don't want to keep disobeying. Any sincere Christian should not want to keep disobeying. If you're, you know, flippant about it, uh, come see me. No sincere Christian is trying to continue sinning. You understand? But I'm also not going to threaten that person. That's hard on us. We want to threat. We wish we could threaten. If you don't watch out, God's going to get you. We said last time, no, the way you say it is, if you don't watch out, the devil's going to get you. Yeah, disobedience opens your life to the devil. But don't bring God in on that. He has freed us from that whole thing. All right. One more, one more scripture. We've got to confirm these things. You know, you can't just take one scripture and run off with your flag. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3. Galatians, after the Corinthians, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 12, or verse 11, but that no one is justified, Galatians 3, 11, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. What does that mean? That means no one who's trying to obey the commands is justified. No one who's trying to obey commands is called righteous. You can only be called righteous or justified if you're in Christ. The just live by faith. Verse 12, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Meaning, if you're trying to obey the commands in order to be right with God, you better do it. Or you're going to have condemnation sitting on top of you. Truth is, nobody can really do it. Most people can't even uh, obey the Ten Commands, much less the 600 others. <laughs> and God's not expecting you to do it like that. The morality of the law, sure we do that. We do it by faith. We don't do it to stay right with God. Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. That means you're purchased out of it. You were a slave in it. Now you're purchased out of it. You've escaped the curse of the law. None of that curse has to touch anybody. Amen. Even the word fever is in that list. Remember that? So fever, you can just squish it with your faith. Because you're not under that law. You're not, you don't have to be susceptible to all of those disastrous things. If, if in your heart is branded, Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. I don't have to pay for my disobedience. I do need to repent of it. I do need to get my conscience clean of it. I do need to stop doing it. 
But I don't have to expect punishment for it. He's not dealt with us according to our iniquities. Christians have access to the blood so we don't have to think that way. What that does is allow us into the living room with God. Even if we haven't been a perfect child. I need to, I need to, really I need to get to the kitchen. I need to the, get to the dinner table. I need to eat. And my sins don't stop me from receiving the blessing. As long as my conscience understands these things. If my conscience feels condemned, I don't really like to go to the dinner table. That's the beauty of understanding Jesus, the cross, the redemption that is in Him and His blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Glory to God. Is everybody happy about that now? Hallelujah. So, the choice system is the reason why Japan had the bombs dropped on them. Japan made a decision. They made a choice to provoke the the USA. Isn't that right? Why did that happen? Because Japan provoked the USA. Their government made a choice that ruined their people. Choices have consequences. Okay? And God has allowed authorities in the earth. He's ordained the powers that be to execute wrath upon those who do evil. So don't get confused about why did God allow that to happen? It was such a detrimental thing. People made a choice. Stubborn human will is a choice. Pride is a choice. Think about pride. People choose to stay in pride and refuse to humble themselves unto the Lord. So He resists them. He gives grace to the humble, but He resists the proud. Pride is a choice. And it stops the blessing of God. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. More information about Stevenson Ministries and Houston Faith Church is available online at HoustonFaith.tv. Chaz and Joni Stevenson are the pastors of a dynamic, growing church in Houston, Texas, and have a New Testament vision of preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit, helping people get saved, and building strong Christians who can impact their world. Houston Faith Church is a place where the love of God is real, where lives are changed, and where followers of Jesus become fishers of men.